As an environmentally friendly mode of transport, railways can once again become the most relevant mode of land transport as part of an integrated multimodal transport chain for passengers and freight. The European Green Deal, proposed by the European Commission, raises the stakes for the transport sector by setting ambitious targets. For example, making the European continent climate neutral by the year 2050. And rail is to play a central role in attaining this target. Dear all, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, webinar of the rail sector and the Green Deals. As both Green MEPs and Chairwoman of Transport and Tourism Committee of the European Parliament, I have always paid very special attention to the race sectors. Why transport is the only sector whose CO2 emissions have increased over the last 20 years, about 26% increases. It is hardly essential to promote support and foster the train across the EU since they are one of the key solutions to comply with our environmental goals. For this purpose, the work of the European Rail Agency has been conducted in the last 16 years if of a major importance. It is, however, not enough and uh, we all should push more eco-friendly solutions, especially the policy makers. This is why, together with uh, the ERA and um, CEO of Ray Freight Transport Company, I have recently launched an initiative to promote rail freight in order to increase its model share to 30% by 2030. This is why I have working a lot on night train, a credible and effective alternative to plans for June between 600 and 1800 kilometers. And this is why we have been working like navies together with my dear colleagues and uh, in uh, the European Parliament to prove, to push, to improve the real passenger rights. Our planet will want way for the COVID crisis to be over to require concrete action. We have, we all have a responsibility with the, this regard today. I therefore will always do my best to make, to to, uh, to a company area and to uh, the railway stakeholders in sustainable initiative and measure. Thank you. Welcome to all participants to this webinar on Game Changer for a Carbon Neutral Economy and the railway contribution to the climate objectives. Before entering into the details of this presentation, I would like to remind the EU targets for 2030 adopted in 2014 and adjusted in 2018. We have three main objectives. One, to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 40%. Two, to increase the share of renewable energy by at least 32%. And three, to improve our energy efficiency by at least 32.5%. The ultimate ambition being to reach a carbon neutral economy in the EU by 2050. But what does that mean for the transport sector? The European Commission issued a communication in December last year containing a global and intersector roadmap, the so-called European Green Deal, aiming at turning an urgent challenge into a unique opportunity. Some ambitious targets have been set. 90% reduction in transport emissions by 2050, a substantial part of the inland freight carried today by road to shift to rail and inland waterways, and 1 million public recharging and refueling stations needed for the 13 million zero and low emission vehicles expected on European roads by 2025. 
Also, no clear direct support has been expressed to rail. Two elements are related to the railway sector. The development of a strategy for sustainable and smart mobility and the development of measures to increase and better manage the capacity of railways. The transport sector is largely considered as one of the biggest challenges ahead to decarbonizing the economy. In this webinar, we would like first to emphasize the green competitive advantage of the railway sector and then elaborate a bit more on the measures which could be taken to foster the railway contribution to climate objectives. There is a strong need of multimodal strategy where the railway sector will become the backbone of the future of our mobility. Thank you, Idris, and good morning, everyone. I will now give you a brief factual overview on the main reasons why we consider railway as the greenest mode of mass transport. As our executive director and Idris mentioned, the ambition of the European Union is to reach a carbon neutral economy by 2050, and rail plays a crucial role to reach this target. You may be wondering why and how, so let's discover it together. Generally speaking, as you can see from this graph, in the European Union, between 1990 and 2017, transport is the second sector in terms of emissions after the energy supply sector, representing 25% of our emissions. I will now focus on four main reasons why railway is a greener mode of transport. First, Railway is a mode of mass transport with the lowest CO2 emissions. If road transportation and aviation increased emissions between 1990 and 2017, railway declined them by 66%, contributing to 0.5% of the emissions of the transport sector. As we all already know, Poor air quality has negative impacts on human health and ecosystems. If we consider railway, it is the sector which barely arms air quality. Second, railway is the mode of transport with the lowest external costs. The total external costs of transport in the European Union are around 987 billion, of which environmental costs are 44%, followed by accident cost, 29%, and congestion cost, 27%. If we focus on the four modes of transport, which have more external costs, road is the largest contributor to external costs, with 820 billion, followed by maritime, aviation, and lastly, rail, with 18 billion. Third, Railway is a sovereign mode of transport, accounting for only 1.7% of the total EU energy consumption in transport, while in 2016 it carried 11% of freight and almost 7% of passengers of all transport modes. Finally, the life expectancy of a railway vehicle is 30 years or more, and even up to 50 years for wagons whereas the life expectancy of a car, bus or truck is between 8 to 15 years. What is also important to point out is that railway vehicles foster the principle of circular economy by keeping materials in use and saving resources. A clear example is given by Mercitalia Fast Service, which reused and adapted high-speed passenger trains into freight trains. On the contrary, cars, buses or trucks mainly supports a linear economy model based on the process of take, make and dispose. Regarding the road transport, it always has more energy needs. Even if European Union policies allowed for efficiency improvements, these are offset by growth in demand and negated by market trends. For example, improved engine efficiency is offset by larger and heavier cars, the so-called SUV effect. As you can see on the right, in the freight sector, road remains the dominant mode within the European Union, also in freight transport, and keeps handling around three quarters of net ton kilometers. 
Second, road transport is a source of congestion. For example, in France, the congestion cost has been estimated at 17 billion in 2013 and could reach even 22 billion in 2030. A dense urban network of public transport, including rail, together with incentives to walking and cycling, represent the smart urban mobility triptych with reduced congestion costs. By looking at the picture on the left, it is also clear that car space occupancy is much higher compared to other modes of transport. My last point regards batteries electrical vehicles. If batteries electrical vehicles play an important role in the mobility transition to carbon neutral sector, it cannot be considered as a cure all solution to the transport emissions. Indeed, I would like to share with you five key concerns on battery electrical vehicles. First, battery production relies on materials concentrated in specific geographical areas, which might create difficulties in the supply chain, especially with increase in the demand. For example, more than 70% of rare earth material are in China. Second, the green level of batteries electrical vehicles depends on the energy mix of the country where it is used and how electricity is produced is key. Third, the smallest and lightest vehicles sufficient for the user's needs shall be used and these shall be driven in an economical style. Fourth, as battery electrical vehicles ownership becomes more mainstream, it shall not lead to greater car use overall through a rebound effect. And last point, the overall transport pattern needs to be tackled, including options such as car sharing and the modal shift to collective transport, soft mobility, micro mobility. This is why, in our view, battery electrical vehicles should be seen more as a solution for those forms of mobility that cannot be substituted by public transport, cycling or walking, especially in rural and remote areas, and not the solution for reducing the impacts of the transport sector in the greenhouse gas emission. I would like now to conclude by emphasizing that railway is the lowest greenhouse gas emission mode of mass transport with the highest degree of energy independence and durability of products. It must be considered the greenest mode of mass transportation and plays a central role in the future of mobility in Europe and in reaching the environmental goals of the European Union. I will now give the floor back to Idris, who will explain us the strategy for a rail renaissance that we need in order to foster the railway sector and make it the backbone of mobility in the next 30 years. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, in order to make the shift to railway real, we have gathered seven measures that put together could shape the strategy for a rail renaissance. In the last 30 years, the EU high-speed network has massively increased and by 2017 extended over 8,400 line kilometer with the initial objective to reach 30,000 by 2030. Shifting flights, primarily short distance one, and cars to conventional and high-speed rail is energy efficient and can deliver significant environmental gain. High-speed rail offers the only established low carbon alternative to aviation, a sector that is one of the most challenging to decarbonize. The modal shift from air to rail when opening a new high-speed line is rather immediate. For instance, when the high-speed line from Paris to Strasbourg opened in 2007, after a year only, the passenger on the air connection dropped from around 2 million to 1 million. In 2016, the second phase of this line has been completed, putting Paris at around 1 hour and 50 minutes from Strasbourg. By spring 2016, there was no more air connection between these two cities. Similar consequences have been observed between Paris and London, Roma and Milano, or Berlin and Munich. We have looked at the worst 20 EU rail connection between biggest urban areas in terms of time and distance and evaluated the potential high-speed rail connection based on the number of current flight passengers and potential intermediary stops. 
It is now imperative when evaluating the merit of a project to compare not only the economic costs with benefits, but also the costs and benefits in terms of increased decrease of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. For the four lines we studied in more details, Paris, Milano, Madrid, Lisboa, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Berlin, Praha, Wien, all with more than 1 million flight passengers per year, we could calculate that the new line could reduce the direct emissions of greenhouse gas between 470,000 tons CO2 equivalent to 780,000 tons CO2 equivalent per year, depending on the actual model shift, representing the equivalent of more than 60,000 flights per year. To ensure good coordination between air and rail, it is also necessary to connect the main European air airports to the railway network. Most of the largest airports in the EU are already connected to a railway network. Among the 30 major EU airports, only Dublin, Budapest, Alicante and Bucharest are not connected to any railway network with a light rail or railway line. The interconnection between the railway network and the main airports would be an important factor for initiatives such as night and flight, flexibly linking a night train journey with a one-way flight as a round trip at a package price through an integrated rail-air ticketing system. This would also require to develop a European network of night trains. Most of the night train connections in many of the EU countries, particularly in the West, are at risk of closure or have already closed mainly due to strong competition with low-cost airlines, but also due to the lack of investment in these services. While at the end of the 80s, nine trains were an efficient alternative to travel in Europe, there are today opportunities to revitalize this type of service. We see two key measures to do so a reduction in the track access charges for the specific market segment and supporting the operators in buying new night trains or refurbishing them. This last measure leads also to the necessity to enhance the industrial railway policy. It is important to stress at this stage that major industrial railway projects have the potential to make the railway more efficient. We are talking here about ERTMS ETCS, which should increase the level of integration of the European railway system and increase the infrastructure capacity up to 40%. Automatic train operation with the potential to increase even more the capacity and lead to energy savings. The imminent emergence of 5G as a key enabler for railway digitalization and the correlated possibilities such as predictive maintenance or multimodal ticketing. All those innovations should reinforce the position of the railway in the transport model share, but there is also a need to eliminate the railway bottlenecks. The European Commission elaborated a study on the missing links on the internal EU borders in 2018. Among the 365 cross-border rail connections identified, 149 are non-operational, representing 41%. A list of the missing links with the highest potential has been established, but many are outside the TNT corridors of the comprehensive network. Funding from, for these cross-border connections, especially for buying ro new rolling stock, should be therefore made available. However, in order to enhance international traffic, we believe the EU needs also a euro control for rail. At the moment, the European rail network consists primarily of interlinked national systems optimized to meet domestic needs the so-called patchwork effect. Despite the important improvements in interoperability in the last decades, the lack of integrated traffic and capacity management is detrimental to traffic predictability and an efficient use of the network. What is needed is a truly European mindset for rail passengers and freight services. An EU-wide control authority, similar to Euro control in civilization, could be created. This will facilitate cross-border pass allocations, increase efficiency and decrease costs for the rail sector, especially for freight. All these projects will, will need the relevant financial instruments to be realized. Negotiations are currently ongoing for multi-annual financial framework 2021-2027 and the budget for connecting Europe facility is to be determined. We are talking about 30 to 40 billion euro. We need also strategic planning to make the best use of the budget assigned. The European Investment Bank is also a fundamental actor in financing railway projects and is currently preparing a climate bank roadmap for 2021 to 2025. The EIB is firmly considering giving priority to electric vehicles and electrified public transport infrastructure. 
Shift to rail and the horizon Europe will also be key for financing innovations in the rail sector. But to ensure fair competition between modes of transport, a kerosene taxation and euro vignette following the Swiss example should be pushed. The user pays and polluter pays principles would be fairly applied, ensuring a level playing field between transport modes. We are reaching the end of this presentation, but before closing it and going through the questions received, let me say some words to conclude. Rail is by far the most energy efficient mode of mass transport for suburban and urban mobility, which in combination with walking and cycling compose the smart mobility triptych. The car is still an essential component of mobility, but the different modes of transport must be integrated in order to put the mobility as a service concept in practice, with the identification of the optimal transport mix in a multimodal approach and holistic view of transport safety. This will lead to the establishment of a new sustainable hierarchy of transport modes, where rail will become the backbone that supports an environmentally sustainable multimodal transport system and will be favored as a transport mode, especially by the younger generations. It is also necessary to remind that during the peak of the COVID-19 crisis in Europe, the daily CO2 emissions were down 17%, and the decrease in emissions will be around 4.2 to 7.5% this year. It is also important to notice that transport accounts for nearly half of the decrease in emissions during confinement. This decrease is an order of magnitude comparable to the rate of decrease needed on a yearly basis over the next decade to limit climate change to 1.5 degree warming. It shows how big the challenge is, especially for the transport sector, and indicates that the railway transport is definitely the transport mode of the future. Thank you for listening to us.